Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast. Joining us today will be Jeb Handworker, the editor of uh, GoldStockTrades.com. Jeb, thanks for joining us. Thanks, John, for having me here here today. All right. Well, first thing I want to get into is today, silver took quite a beating, and so did gold. Bernanke talked about uh, accommodative monetary policy. If you ask me, he really didn't say anything because he doesn't want to I think he doesn't want to show his hand that he has no exit strategy. So uh, what's your view on uh, the recent gold market? It's been pretty tough for precious metals investors. Well, you know, it's been pretty tough over the past couple of years. Um, and But, you know, we have to take a longer-term perspective. Uh, from the 2001 30-year low in gold, and gold was trading at 250 an ounce, uh, we've seen a rally to the 1900 area. Uh, this has been an exceptional 12-year gain, um, and it's quite uh, normal to have retracements and corrections in what we're, in what we're seeing. Uh, the psychology of the market, uh, what you're talking about, people are reacting very much uh, following what the Bernanke says. Uh, I believe in much more and follow what he does rather than and what they're what they have been doing uh and what they have done over the past uh since it's been in existence and the devaluation of the dollar of more than 98%. Um so over the long term it's really important that precious metals investors should not be scared or shaken here to realize that this is a characteristic mid-cycle correction 50% um which what we're seeing, we've already seen the 50% uh, in silver, gold's almost there to the 50%. We're hitting those 30-year, once-in-a-generation type lows um, in the venture, in the exploration stocks, in the producers. Um, a lot of the similar characteristics, what we saw in that 2001 low, um, we're seeing now with miners, um, we're seeing uh, projects being written down, uh, we're seeing the uh, the miners uh, uh, doing the same things that they did back then, laying off employees, brokerage firms no not recommending uh, mining stocks after the Brex scandal um, in the late 90s. This was it was very similar, where the brokers uh, uh, didn't want to have anything to do with mining stocks. Uh, but then the, uh, the the area next then after Brex came Enron, which was in the energy. And then after uh, Enron came the whole uh, dot-com uh, crash, and, and so it went from the BREX to the other sectors. Um, but we're seeing a lot of that similarity to that, that late 90s, um, once-in-a-generation type low. The venture went on after this low to go up 450%. Um, I would not be surprised if we see over the next three to five years in the junior miners to see a similar type move like we saw in 2001 to 2007, a 400 to 500% move uh, in the venture. Uh, and what, what I believe is going on uh, is that we're in a cycle, uh, we, we're, we're coming out of this sort of deflationary cycle that we had the past couple of years. Now we're beginning to see oil breaking through the $105 barrier uh, natural gas has gone from two to four dollars. Yields, Treasury yields, are beginning to rise. This is all indicating to me that inflation, I mean, inflationary investors have to be uh, hedged with inflation-sensitive uh, investments. So the greatest hedges against uh, inflation is buying real, tangible assets, uh, precious metals, uh, commodities. And the mining stocks, which are so incredibly once-in-a-generation type buying opportunity right now. Yeah, I definitely agree. Right now, uh, in terms of in terms of buying uh, mining stocks, some miners are in deep trouble. But I think the ones that survive and thrive, not only will they recoup the losses people may have, but they'll go and make returns that. They they didn't even imagine were possible. Just right now, it's sort of hard to believe. Uh, would you agree with that statement? Or I think it's really important if you're investing in the junior mining space 
uh, is to follow what you said before, the management. The management that have been through down cycles before. Look for management that have been around for 30, 40 years. You know, people have this misconception about the junior miners thinking that it's some promotional uh, CEO from Vancouver. And there's been this sort of portrayal of the junior miners like this. But the reality is the junior miners tracked some of the top management from the seniors. After many of these uh, executives have a career with the seniors, they go on and try to build uh, their own uh, situation with the juniors. And it's really important for investors to communicate uh, and, and to investigate the management teams, how much does the management team own? Uh, does the management team, has the management team been through cycles like this? Have they been able to build value through down cycles before? Uh, and you have to remember that with gold mining stocks, especially in the exploration, Barrick, for instance, um, Barrick became Barrick in the late 80s. This was one of the worst gold markets uh in decades, and Barrick went from American Barrick Resources, which was producing 16,000 ounces a year, uh, to becoming the largest gold miner, and that's through the power of discovery and the, the, the acquisition they made in Nevada and the discovery at the Gold Strike Mine, which totally transformed the company. And this was during a bear market in precious metals and miners. And the same thing can happen today. Um, just because... Uh, we're seeing a down, downturn in the total resource market. There are really gems out there um, that have been showing some great relative strength. There's been some commodities and metals which have been up this past year, or, which many investors have, are completely unaware of. There's some resource stocks, in, especially in the uranium sector, that are in powerful uptrends. Um, so there's a lot of good things that are occurring uh, in the resource market, and once the cycle turns and the wave comes, um, you know, it's the companies that have been building value during this downturn uh, and that are active that will really be the, the front runners uh, in the next bull market. Yeah, and I definitely like to say when evaluating a stock, you definitely want to look at one that has a good amount of cash on the balance sheet so they can survive this because I see this maybe playing out, you know, up until maybe 2014 when the when there's a new Fed chairman because I think Bernanke just doesn't want to be known. I think one of the reasons he could be doing this tapering talk is because he knows that they can't stop printing, but also he's in a lucky position where he gets to pass – the next round of stimulus on to the next Fed chairman. And when that does, bad things do happen, he could say, hey, I wanted to taper. Uh -huh. And uh, that's what I'm seeing right now. It's just Bernanke, you know, being able to say, hey, I wanted to, put, I wanted to taper two to three years from now. But you bring up the uranium sector, and I consider that the ultimate contrarian play right now. Right now they're... Basically, they're pricing in an oversupply, but HEU, the megatons, megawatts, that's coming to an end. You're seeing China, they're going to put on new uh, nuclear reactors. They're coming online. And Japan, they're actually looking like they might restart it. Mm -hmm. That seems like an uh, – you want to talk about contrarian play that's been ignored and forgotten. Right, and uh, right now everyone's keeping an eye on the uranium price, which is below forty dollars a pound. Uh, and again, you know, we, ha you know, you're talking about Bernanke. Yet uh, in in baseball, there's a changeup, and the great pitchers, what they do is uh, they use the windup to confuse the batter. Um, but the most important thing when you're batting or investing is to watch the ball, not the windup. And uh, so we have to really watch, you know, watch the ball and be concerned, you know, be careful of all these uh, tapering, not tapering. The reality is, is that it's going to be is printing and devaluation and we're going to see inflation. And one of the sectors that you're right, that I've been bullish on since even during Fukushima, I was one of the few advocates uh, of the Iranian mining sector 
that the uranium, you know, uranium miners and the nuclear sector was left for dead. Everyone thought that that Fukushima uh, destroyed nuclear. Well, that's not the case. Uh, Japan's just made an application to turn on 10 nuclear reactors. Um, the miners uh, are beginning to to we're, we're seeing a lot of interest in discovery in the Athabasca Basin. We've had some some gains of exponential gains uh, in in the in the discovery uh, in the Patterson Lake in the western part of the Athabasca Basin, which is a really historic um, discovery. Um, we're seeing increasing uh, M and A. Uh, for instance, uranium one was taken over by the Russians. There's not many publicly traded producing uranium companies anymore. The only one that's traded on the New York Stock Exchange is Cameco, the CCJ. Um, after Cameco, you have Paladin. That's not even traded. Uh, you had Uranium One, but now Uranium One's going private, but that wasn't traded on the, uh, on the New York Stock Exchange. So there's very few opportunities and when the funds become aware of this uh, and they want to get into this sector, there really could be an explosive move because there's just so few uh, opportunities. There's rising M&A activity. Uh, we saw with Denison uh, re recently this year, Energy Fuels in Strathmore in the U.S. Um, rising M&A activity, the miners outperforming the uranium price, you know, this means to us, you know, whenever you see the miners beginning to outperform the underlying com commodity, this usually forecasts a rebound in the underlying commodity. Um, so we're beginning to see this outperformance. Canico is up 30 percent uh, since the November low. Uh, the uranium spot price is still at $38. So this is all signaling to me a bullish uh, reversal to the sector. And, and as you said, there's, there's a few factors that's, that can cause this, this bullish reversal. We have a supply shortfall already uh, that's being made up by this Russian megatons to megawatts program. And this has been made up annually for the past 20 years of 24 million pounds a year. This is a ton of uranium that's going to be gone from the market. And we have to remember that in the U.S., uh, the U.S. is the largest consumer of uranium. They, they consume over 55 million pounds a year. And... U.S. uranium pr miners produce less than 8% of what's used right now in the U.S. So uh, we have the supply shortfall. We see Japan turning the nuclear reactors back on. And, you know, they, they have to turn these reactors back on. The electricity costs are getting out of control. Natural gas has doubled. It went from 2 to $4, or 450 Uh the 450 is not what the Japanese pay. They're paying much higher. They got to ship it there. And oil, they got to ship it there. Um, so these electricity costs, brownouts have been skyrocketing for the Japanese. The new government is making a major push into nuclear. Uh, not only nuclear in Japan, but nuclear abroad. They're traveling, the Japanese are traveling the world trying to sell nuclear technology. So they are pro nuclear, 10 Japanese nuclear. Nuclear reactors are, are turning back on. We think that's just the beginning. China is building. John, we can't forget there's unrest in the Middle East. I mean, for some reason, the, the, the media doesn't want to show this, but we have uh, over 100,000 people have been killed in Syria. Uh, riots are happening in Turkey. Uh, Egypt uh, had just had a military coup. Uh, you know, this is, this, this is a, a ticking time bomb. The, the Middle East crisis has transformed from what they thought was an Arab Spring into this never-ending civil war, an Arab nightmare. Uh, the Suez Canal, the Strait of Hormuz, could be shut down. This could cause a spike in energy prices. And, you know, the last thing I want to say about nuclear is public sentiment is really turning positive. There was just a documentary that was just released that won a bunch of reward, uh, awards uh, and the Sundance Film Festival, and it's being shown throughout the country. It's called Pandora's Promise, and uh, it explores really the transformation of, of environmentalists who are anti-nuclear uh, into believers of the benefits of nuclear power. And this is really where we're beginning to see these, you know, the head of Greenpeace, the, the environmentalists who are once so anti-nuclear when they look and they study this sector. Um, they're beginning to realize 
that there's a major gap between fossil fuels and renewables. Wind and solar and all these alternatives, hydro, they're not going to make it up. Uh, the coal and natural gas and oil, the demand is soaring. The only way to bring that demand down is to is to, for nuclear. And um, I wouldn't be surprised if you start seeing more environmental organizations, um, especially after this recent experiment in Germany and Japan where they went – against nuclear and thereby re relied on coal and oil, uh, carbon emissions and air pollution went out up the roof, uh, went crazy in Germany and Japan. Um, we're beginning to see that a lot of those myths that came out after Fukushima, where, um, where people felt that, that, that Fukushima uh, was the end all, uh, it really was a mass hysteria and a knee jerk reaction. Now we're going to beginning to see two and a half years later, Japan's turning reactors back on. Germany may soon make a pivot towards nuclear. Um, and technically, uranium's making a, a double bottom, uh, and it looks like it's bottoming here and about to, to clear the 200-day moving average. And we think that um, JP Morgan just put out a report. They say $90 by 2016. We think that... Uh, that could even happen even sooner because there's just so many uh, there's so, there, there's so many catalysts uh, for the sector. Uh, President Obama just uh, spoke about climate change. Uh, where we have a massive heat wave uh, in the U.S. right now throughout the eastern and Midwest states. Um, this has become a, a major issue, and nuclear is vital for modern economy to produce baseload electricity without increasing noxious air emissions and, and, and uh, pollutants. Well, one other thing is uh, Russia is now coming out with floating nuclear technology. Uh, that is the same country that cornered Uranium One. So obviously they have plans for their nuclear infrastructure. Uh, Saudi Arabia wants to build 16 nuclear power plants. Uh, Dubai is having a free trade deal with Australia. So a lot of countries in the Mideast, the land of oil, are building nuclear, too. And hardly, you know, this, uh, I think nuclear uh, power, it's here to stay. Germany, their uh, electricity, since they've had that abandoned nuclear, their electricity costs have uh, risen significantly, too. Have you read anything? Have you read about that or... Well, uh, the Germany situation, they they have a, a major backlash. Merkel's up for election. Uh, she tried to build this massive wind farm in the Black Sea, uh, uh, in the North Sea, and uh, it's just, it, it, economically, it's if you look at the numbers, the costs to replace nuclear are are just, would bankrupt bankrupt Germany. It's, it's not possible. Uh, it's the same thing with natural gas. People think that natural gas can all of a sudden, we can just build natural gas plants and uh, we can just go into all natural gas. It doesn't work like that. It's too expensive. It, there, we don't have the infrastructure yet for that. Uh, it's not economically feasible. Uh, you need to have a balanced, uh, clever, uh, uh, long-term approach when you approach uh, when you look at the energy sector. Um, and you have to be careful of these sort of knee-jerk political moves um, which, which really, uh, which really has major consequences on the consumers. Oh, definitely. So, and speaking of energy, you were talking about the civil unrest in the Middle East. That that seems like, in my opinion, that that's what's driving oil, and that's what's got it out of its range and up to over a hundred and six dollars. Right. Would yeah. you agree? I think uh, what we're seeing in the Middle East, uh, what we've we've seen now, uh, I guess ten years uh, since we went into Iraq, um, it is it turning into a real disaster. I mean, the amount of money that's been spent on these wars in Afghanistan. I, I just saw that they spent thirty-five million dollars on a on a base they'll never use. I mean, this is I you know I don't know what our debt is like, but you know. These wars are usually, uh, and especially now we're going on a decade-long war, that's not getting better, that I don't see any sign of improvement, that's just getting worse and worse. Okay, 
you know, we went into one of the, some of the greatest inflations after some of these wars, like the the Civil War, and uh, these these they're extremely inflationary. And I'm I'm really concerned about the Middle East. I think it's totally off the radar. Um, but both sides in this conflict, uh, we don't know which side to take. Um, and it's it, it's uh, we've become mired in this sort of situation that. Uh, it's hard to get out of, and it's really, I think, uh, it's going to have a major impact on the markets. Um, and the U.S. has to really start thinking about how do we have energy independence. I mean, uranium is a disaster. I mean, they only produce mine eight percent of what they consume. Uh, potash, you know, that's another, you know, fertilizer, food. Uh, you know, they they only they rely on mostly imports for that. Um, rare earths and the, some of these strategic metals that are energy and for defense applications totally dependent on other uh, countries. So, and on unstable countries, um, so you know, like platinum brute metals, like platinum and palladium. Uh, South Africa, what we're see- witnessing in South Africa with the labor uh, unrest uh, and the violence that's occurred there. Uh, there's over seventy-five uh, percent of platinum supply comes from South Africa, um, so that's a whole another region uh, which is 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 deteriorating. So when you're looking into the mining sector, um, looking for the right location in a geopolitically secure area is is more important than ever right now. Yeah, and we definitely say at Wall Street from A Street, make sure you're uh, geopolitically diversified. Because you never know where the next risk is going to come. Uh, you just don't know. South Africa was looking beautiful uh, a couple of years ago, and then this happened. So uh, you just, to me, it seems like you don't know. I remember in uh, South Africa used to be an emerging market. They thought that was uh, on the upswing. So, so just uh, one last topic is. Uh, if you had to look at it, it's unreal that the stock market's outperforming despite all the fundamentals. Uh, do you think that we'll see a reversal where the resource sector now makes the big gains and the stock market goes down, or do you think the stock market will just could just limp on while the uh, because of the inflated uh, currency and the money printing and the resource sector will now have its turn in the next three to five years? Well, you know everything is. Uh, cyclical and the economic cycle, uh, especially, uh, you have different phases. What we've been going, what's been going on since the end of QE2, uh, first we had a major rally in the bond prices uh, up in, until the summer of 2012. Then we had bonds and stocks rallying together, and this usually happens during a contraction. Um, of the phase uh, of the economic phase, but now we're beginning to see um, we're moving into that the bonds are declining and the stocks are rising. Soon we're going to start seeing the inflationary pressures where stocks and commodities move together, and eventually, as the inflationary pressures pick up, we're going to see the commodities begin outperforming in the later uh, part of this uh, cycle. So. That's what I'm seeing right now. The over the equity markets are extremely overbought, almost moving parabolic from all this money printing. It's going straight into uh, a few sectors. Not not um, it's going into uh, housing, um, the financials, um, really uh, focused on a few sectors. But you know, I'm not sure if we start seeing interest rates perking up again, how stable this housing market is. I know that a lot of these funds from emerging markets have come into the U.S. real estate market over the past couple of years, and I've been been highlighting that for a while, that the Japanese have been buying uh, U.S. real estate. But eventually, as interest rates begin to rise, I don't know, and with the unemployment rate uh, and the economy not really, the underlying economy still very weak, I'm not sure if it's justified these overbought levels um, in the housing and the financials, and um, and it can get even more overbought and more parabolic. But I know uh, when I start to see these moves, you know, back in October of 2011, 
um, you know, when the market was down and everyone was worried about these debt fears, you know, we, we indicated that there would be a re reversal. But now, after this long rally and being so extended above the 200-day moving average, I think it's wise if investors begin to look to possibly diversify, um, and especially diversify uh, in sectors that are extremely undervalued uh, and extremely ignored, um, because eventually we're going to see some of this capital and more investors be concerned. Um, instead of just looking for small dividends, they're going to be looking at how do, how do I beat inflation? Um, and the best way historically of beating inflation uh, is through a portfolio of uh, having a, uh, exposure to precious metals, uh, energy, commodities, um, uh, natural resources and the mining stocks. So uh, I think we're in this beginning of a of a of a bottoming process in the precious metals uh, and the commodities and the venture. And I think we're at a turning point uh, in equities. It may go higher, um, but you know, and may get overbought and may get more rational. But I'd be careful to get caught up in that. Instead, look. Um, at really the high quality junior miners in the right jurisdictions with the, the right management team, a strong treasury, and that are progressing uh, even during this difficult uh, resource market. All right. Definitely sounds good. And uh, just out of curiosity, if uh, people want to find out more about you, uh, how can they do so? Uh, go to goldstocktrades.com. And you can sign up for my free newsletter. Uh, you can also take a free 30-day trial of my uh, premium service on my website. Uh, no credit card is needed. Uh, just sign up with your name and email, and you can see um, some of the, the, the work that we put out where we cover the precious metal markets, um, the currency is, uh, the, you know, markets like uranium and coal and um and, and energy so uh and we have interviews with uh some of these key management um that that i know have a proven track record so you can go to goldstocktrades.com and, and sign up for my free newsletter there